Hello, it's another week in Parliament. and Welcome to your favorite parliamentary news magazine program, The Chamber, right here on City TV. My name is Duke Mentopoku. We'll take a break here. When I come back, we'll delve into today's edition. Stay with us. You're welcome back from the break and from that breather. This is still The Chamber, as we usually do on this program. We'll begin by bringing you up to speed with what has transpired in Parliament over the parliamentary week. And um, we curate the major news, major happenings in Parliament in the recap segment. So here's the recap for the week. The motion was moved by MP for Ejuma Kwenyan Isiam, Dr. Keso Atoforsen. After moving the motion, Deputy Majority Leader Alexander Penyomakin raised a preliminary objection against the motion on several grounds. If we allow them to even proceed any further, Mr. Speaker, we'll be certain a certain president that this house can never contain in future. We want to render the work of our select committees so yours. Is that what we want to do? We want to disable our own tools as parliamentarians. We want to go partisan on all issues of national importance. We are not concerned about the roads that government needs in the to fix them so that all of us will get happy. Is that not what we want? We are no more concerned about the unemployment situation that government is seeking to invest monies in the private sector for the young entrepreneur to find what to do you are no more interested but you are interested in rather confusing Ghanaians and creating a certain impression that the work of the auditor general and article 187 which work is yet to be completed you want to say that there should be a committee to investigate what mr speaker having said all of this i submit that the motion is inappropriate. The motion has not been properly mounted. The content of the motion is being mounted in bad faith. The motion, if considered by this house, would amount to undermine a constitutional authority given to the Auditor General under Article 187. Minority Leader Harana Idrusu impressed upon the house for reasons of accountability to accept the motion for a probe into COVID-19 expenditure. I'm holding with me here the budget statement, page 47, of the Government of Ghana for 2020 financial year. In paragraph 168, this is what the Minister of Finance said. This brings total COVID-19 related expenditures to 2.646 billion. 2,646,000,000 million against a target of 2.877 million. Yet, as we probed the expenditure of ministries department, we could not get this expenditure accounted for. The reason we are calling for an inquiry into how COVID expenditure was made. After other contributions, the first deputy speaker gave his ruling on the matter. The matters that were called upon to set the committee to investigate, can we say they do not come under any of the select or standing committees of the House? Yes. In my view, it falls squarely within the Public Accounts Committee. And indeed, all the committees of the House, including the Public Accounts Committee, are bipartisan. And the Public Accounts Committee by nature is designed to be chaired by the minority. So in all its forms, in all the questions related to the Public Accounts Committee, if it is minded to investigate anything related to the COVID expenditure, it's fully seized with the authority and the power to investigate that, particularly because all the accounting of it have been provided for in the budget which budget has been presented before the House and it is before the committee anyway. My view is that this motion ought not to have been admitted and is improperly before the House as a rule. Still in the House, the Minority Caucus on the Communications Committee toured some Ghana card registration centers. The tour ended at the headquarters of the National Identification Authority, ranking and the deputy on the committee shared the observations after the tour. We have also gotten the report from the Ghanaian people about the cost of premium registration. That the 250 cities, Ghanaians say it is way too expensive for them. 
That's an issue we will be raising with the NIA when we meet with them tomorrow about the cost of premium because most Ghanaians are going to have challenges with that amount and so if it's parliament that approved it parliamentarians are representatives of the people if the people who sent us there say that the 250 we approved is too high we will review it and drop it for the Ghanaian people so we would we would get the final word from the ranking member of the committee and he would he would help us put everything in perspective but we can assure you of one thing that we will continue to work in your sole interest and ensure that this process goes as smoothly as possible. We are meeting the Director General of the NIA, Mr. Kenyatefwa in Parliament, and you can be sure that our coming here will inform us about the issues we are going to put to him to ensure that the right thing is done and uh, the, 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 the processes leading to every Ghanaian assessing and getting the card will be available to all of you. So thank you very much. And let me assure you that we are going to work for your, your interest and your benefit. From all indications, the speaker was unenthused with the direction his first deputy took the House on Tuesday in relation to the minority's motion for a probe into COVID-19 expenditure. When he took his seat on Wednesday, the speaker had some choice words to describe the events of the previous day. I'm not sure you have appreciation of the temperature of the country. Neither am I sure you know the arduous nature of the responsibility that have been placed on your shoulders. The martial department get ready. I will be compelled to get a marshal to get people arrested and sent out. You are saying, hey, parliament is not a place for joking. Is a place for business, serious national business. The parliament we are in has never been in Ghana, even Gold Coast. This is a different type of parliament. We might be prepared to change, to accept the decision of the people and work together. You make me sick. Will you shut up? You rule out of order in the house. The penchant of the first of this figure to overrule my rulings is to say the least unconstitutional, illegal, and offensive. Be that as it may, I shall not be taking any steps to overrule the decision of the first deputy speaker to dismiss the motion as moved by the Honorable Ranking Member of the Finance Committee. The Deputy Speakers and I will deliberate on how to present a more coherent and uniform structure in respect of rulings so that the House is guided at all times during deliberations. The minority leader took a cue from the speaker's comments and indicated that there would be a formal challenge of the ruling setting aside their motion. As you yourself have rightly advised, we will challenge the ruling of your first deputy to which you have so eloquently addressed this morning. But we want the record to be suddenly captured that this was his objection. His objection was based on Article 187. He, he said so so that tomorrow into the foreseeable future we will know what guided the ruling for purpose of uh, litigating on it as we intend to do. Later on, the Minister for the Interior answered questions on the closure of land borders due to COVID-19. Government is aware of the impact that the closure of land borders is having on border communities, especially their business. It must, however, be noted that the closure does not affect only border residents in Aflawa in particular, but Ghanaian businesses generally. Because you realize that there are strict movement regulations as to how you can send in and bring out goods. It is in this regard that the government introduced the Ghana COVID-19 alleviation and revitalization of enterprises support cares also known as a Batampa program, to alleviate the impact on businesses and other sectors of the economy. It is my conviction that Ghanaians in general and those along the borders, including Aflao, will take advantage of the intervention 
can have the fortunes of their businesses till the borders are open, hopefully. MP for Ketu South, Jifa Ablagumashi, who posed questions, expressed dissatisfaction with the answers from the Minister for the Interior. Which part of that decision considers the effect of that closure on the people? What are they supposed to be doing? And it's the same community that had the tidal waves last year. So you have um, a human decision and then a force majeure, and it's about the same people. And each time I ask, what is, what was considered during the decision making on, this, uh, on the closure of the border? What went into that? What went into that? It's two years down the line. Even if you didn't consider that before, and you see that it's prolonged, and this has never happened before. You're welcome back from the break. This week on the From the Floor segment, we are indeed bringing you um, sites from the floor of Parliament. And there was a motion that was moved uh, by Dr. Kisela to force in from the minority. It was filed by three members of the minority for Parliament to constitute a bipartisan committee to probe government's COVID-19 expenditure. Now, this motion was moved, but there was a preliminary objection raised by Alexander Apenyomarkin, Deputy Majority Leader, which was upheld by the first Deputy Speaker for re obvious reasons. But the Speaker reacted a day after. This week on the From the Floor segment, we'll first of all bring you the debate that characterized the moving of the motion, the preliminary objection, and its subs subsequent rejection. We'll bring you that in the first part. Let's take the first part. I'll be back uh, with you for the second part. By an imperative of the Constitution to exercise oversight. But again, the same Constitution has provisions that specifically mandate some institutions to do certain work. It is my contention that per the argument of the applicant in this house, all the issues he has raised, giving rise to his prayer, fall squarely under Article 187 of the Constitution. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And to the extent that those matters he has raised fall squarely under 187, Mr. Speaker, I dare say and submit that we are not seized with a jurisdiction to constitute that committee he seeks to ask us to do. Mr. Speaker, what the, what the applicant tried telling us was that certain approvals were made, public funds were spent, and during media review, they saw some overexpenditure, they saw certain figures, and they are not comfortable with it, and those figures don't add up. The Honorable Gentleman from Asawase, Honorable Mutaka Mubarak, who seconded the motion, also reiterated the same point. If these are their concerns, Mr. Speaker, I they say that an attempt to immediately proceed on that path would amount to usurping the powers of the Auditor General as contained under Article 187. For the avoidance of that, Mr. Speaker, I shall proceed to read Article 187. There shall be an Auditor General of Ghana whose office shall be a public office. Two, the public account of Ghana and of all public offices, including the courts, the central and local government administrations of the universities and public institutions of like nature, of any public corporation or other body or organization established by an act of parliament shall be audited and reported on by the Auditor General. Mr. Speaker, Dr. Kessel had to force it on his feet, argued that the funds were not spent by one ministry. These funds were spent by ministries, agencies. Mr. Speaker, let me then proceed to Clause 5. The Auditor General shall within six months after the end of the immediately preceding financial year to which each of the account mentioned in Clause 2 of this article relates, submit his report to Parliament, and shall in that report draw attention to any irregularities in the account. Mr. Speaker, emphasis mine. Audited 
and to any other matter which in his opinion ought to be brought to the notice of parliament. Mr. Speaker, the question is whether or not the matter being raised by them for us to consider have already been determined by the Auditor General. They are each raising issues of irregularity to them. Their accounts are not regular. To them, their expenditure do not add up. But the question is, are these concerns not premature? Are we not taking away the constitutional mandate of the Auditor General? Mr. Speaker, it is my submission, with the greatest respect, that this invitation must not be accepted by us. He is leading us, honorable to force it. He's leading us into a certain plateau of confusion. He's leading this house into a certain plateau of confusion. A place of nowhere. We cannot entertain that. The Auditor General has this mandate to look at the account, Mr. Speaker, at the risk of being repetitive. I would read it once more. The Auditor General shall, within six months after the end of the immediately preceding financial year, to which each of the accounts mentioned in clause 2 of this article relates, submit his report to Parliament and shall in a report draw attention to any irregularities. Mr. Speaker, is it the case that government institutions have denied the Auditor General access to their records? Is it the case that government is refusing to allow the Auditor General to do its work? Is it the case that the Auditor General has submitted any report on the subject matter of which certain irregularities have been raised? Even so, even so, such a report will go to the Public Account Committee, chaired by the minority through its able Deputy Minority Leader, Honorable James QJ Avergini. And there is a committee headed by you, Honorable Kluche Aveji. Mr. Speaker, so there is nothing to hide. A moment ago, you were directing me to due process. Due process. You were saying that we should move step by step. There's a constitutional imperative here. You are alleging irregularities and you want Parliament to constitute an ad hoc committee to do that which a constitutional pillar is mandated to do. Mr. Speaker, what you are inviting us to do has never been the intent of the fairness of the Constitution. Two, Mr. Speaker, granted without admitting that, Mr. Speaker, my first ground of objection does not even find favor with you and the House. The second issue, Mr. Speaker, is the fact that we have a select committee on health. We will have a bona fide responsibility to look into the expenditure and activities of the various ministries. That is why they are there to oversight. Mr. Speaker, if the contention of the applicant is that we are dealing with various ministries, then the question is that the various committee leadership, what are they doing? Is there any document before them of which government agency is denying them access? Mr. Speaker, the committees have approved the expenditure for 2022 we did committee hearing by consensus. We came here to approve the expenditure. Where were they? The very issues that they are contending. If it's not for mischief, what else? Mr. Speaker, three. Honorable Kessel Atro Fawcett, my very respected friend, knows that he has some tools available at his disposal. On the 66, 67, you can file a question. If you say there were some irregularities for the record, you have not ask any question regarding COVID-19 expenditure. You have not asked any question. 
That is why I just say that your application is being mounted in bad faith. If you believe that agencies of government have misapplied, have failed to properly account for, why having to follow the question specifically aimed at an, a minister, that will give you the required result. So, Mr. Speaker, I dare contend again that until that tool is exhausted, this application in its form and shape and without in substance is in bad faith. It is only part of the partisan politicking and nothing more. Before I speak to the motion, Mr. Speaker, let me refer you to the text of the motion. And Mr. Speaker, the text of the motion reads, reads that this honorable house constitute a bipartisan parliamentary committee chaired by a member of the minority caucus to inquire into the expenditures made by Ghana government in relation to COVID-19. Mr. Speaker, the words there are to inquire. May I, with respect, Mr. Speaker, refer you to the very constitution my colleague relied on by referring you to Article 103 of the 1992 constitution. It provides, and Mr. Speaker, for this purpose, I'm relying on Article 1033. Committees of Parliament shall be charged with such functions, including the investigation and inquiry inquiry into the activities and administration of ministries and departments as parliament may determine and such investigation and inquiry may extend to proposals for legislation. Mr. Speaker, nowhere in this motion is reference made to the word audit. Nowhere in this motion this motion, the wording are sorry. clear. I'm sorry. Give words, give words their ordinary meaning. It is only when the primary meaning of words leads to absurdity yes. that is when you employ other words. Article 1033. But Mr. Speaker, suffice it to add, I'm coming back to his own article he relied on, Article 187. And Mr. Speaker, he says that this house should not proceed because of Auditor General. Mr. Speaker, 1877. 1877. In the performance of its functions under this Constitution or any other law, the Auditor General shall not be subject to the direction or control of any person or authority. So it is not for us to direct or control what the Auditor General ought to do. But Mr. Speaker, even still there, even still there, even still there, you quoted, you quoted Article 187, and then you quoted Article 1875. Let's go to 1875. The Auditor General shall, within six months, after the end of the immediately preceding financial year, to which each of the accounts mentioned in clause 2 of this article relates, submit his report to Parliament. We are in 2022. 2020 lapse. Therefore, the preceding year into 2021, where is the Auditor General report on COVID-related expenditure? On COVID, on COVID, on COVID-related expenditure. On COVID. On COVID. On COVID, no, I said 2020. I said 20, no, I quoted you. Mr. Speaker, you said within six months. So 2020 have lapsed. Each preceding year would have been mid year of 2021. I have not come across any dedicated report on COVID expenditure by the Auditor General. But Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, the only way we can fight graft and corruption is to shine light on public expenditure, particularly reckless and irresponsible expenditure. We are only asking for a full-scale public inquiry 
into how government resources were spent, nothing more. We are asking for a public city where the citizens of Ghana will hear how many dedicated to COVID were spent by the ruling administration. Is this what for which we have been told that technically don't go there, leave it to the Auditor General? Mr. Speaker, I'm holding with me here the budget statement, page 47, of the Government of Ghana for 2020 financial year. In paragraph 168, this is what the Minister of Finance said. This brings total COVID-19 related expenditures to 2.646 billion, 2 billion 646 million against a target of 2.877 million. Yet, as we probed the expenditure of ministries department, we could not get this expenditure accounted for. The reason we are calling for an inquiry into how COVID expenditure was made, whether it was used to procure PPEs or sanitizers or facilitate Zoom meetings, we have been told how much money was spent on Zoom. And it's only Ghana who spent that colossal sum of money for purpose of Zoom meetings. So, Mr. Speaker, if you go to the expenditure of this same budget, it is accounted for and as was related by earlier speakers, one, one will be at a loss why this House will not unanimously support an inquiry into COVID-related expenditure. The Auditor General will do his work anyway, but as I said, he is not subject to our direction or control. But I agree that he is an ally of Parliament. But I said you quoted Article 187. So given that 2020 we needed an Auditor General report on it, the preceding period will have been mid-year into 2021. We are almost going half-year into 2022. And, 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 Mr. Speaker, our donors are interested in how we spend COVID money. The World Bank representative in Ghana is reported to have said that some 2.871 million, 2.87 billion, representing about 435 million US dollars, was spent on COVID. Where is the money? How was it used? How was it spent? We need to know. The World Bank, the World Bank also gave us two allocations of 1 billion US dollars. In today's exchange rate, 6.6 .6 billion. So as the Honorable Whip related, even just the exchange rate regime is work proven. Let's know. You got to rule on the preliminary objection raised by the Deputy Majority Leader. If I understand the prelim preliminary objection correctly, it seems to suggest that the motion ought not have been admitted. And therefore, it questions, on, it questions the propriety of the motion before the House. And in presenting the preliminary objection, the Honourable Member draws the House's attention to the constitutional imperatives. Now, let me start by looking at the motion itself, the motion before the House. It's numbered item 21, and it reads that this honorable House constitutes a bipartisan parliamentary committee chaired by a member of the minority caucus to inquire into the expenditures made by Ghana government in relation to COVID-19 since the outbreak of the pandemic in the year 2020. So, I would have thought that for a bipartisan co committee 
or by whatever name we call it, we will be referring to Order 191, a special or ad hoc committees, since the bipartisan committee is neither a select committee or a standing committee. So let me read Order 191 for our guidance. The House may at any time, by motion, appoint special or ad hoc committee to investigate any matter of public importance, to consider any bill that does not come under the jurisdiction of any of the standing or select committees of the House. A matter of public importance or a bill which does not come under the jurisdiction of any of the standing or select committees of the House. And I think that should be the guiding principle. The matters that we are called upon to set a committee to investigate, can we say they do not come under any of the select or standing committees of the House? In my view, it falls squarely within the Public Accounts Committee. And indeed, all the committees of the House, including the Public Accounts Committee, are bipartisan. And the Public Accounts Committee, by nature, is designed to be chaired by the minority. So in all its forms, in all the questions related to the Public Accounts Committee, if it is minded to investigate anything related to the COVID expenditure, it fully stays with the authority and the power to investigate that, particularly because all the accounting of it have been provided for in the budget, which budget has been presented before the House and it is before the committee anyway. My view is that this motion ought not to have been admitted and is improperly before the House as a rule. So you saw there how the motion was moved, preliminary objection, and finally dismissed by the first deputy speaker. But the next day, the Speaker of Parliament himself, Alban Bagwin, <laughs> was not pleased at all with what his, what his deputy had done, his first deputy had done, and actually had some choice words for him. Here is the second part. I have occasioned the need to make this statement and provide clarity and some perspective on some of the issues raised on the floor yesterday. Honorable member, will you resume your seat? The one standing behind leadership. Please, get out. As you may recall, the Honourable Member of Parliament for the Ajuma Enyam Esien Constituency, Honourable Kesel Atu Forsen Ba, Ranking Member of the Committee on Finance, moved a motion. Which motion was for the House to constitute a bipartisan committee to look into the activities of the government with respect to COVID-19 expenditure. I must note that this motion was submitted to me, and I admitted same within the context of Order 79-4 of the Standing Orders of the House. Order 79-4 of the Standing Orders of the House. When the Honorable Atul Forsen was on his feet in an attempt to table the motion, the Deputy Majority Leader, Honorable Alexander Kwamina Afijo Markin, rose to make a preliminary objection to the tabling of the motion. It was at this juncture that I asked him to suspend his objection, wait for the motion to be tabled, and then he may proceed to submit his objection. Indeed, as is apparent on the face of the record of proceedings, he sought clarification 
on the extent of my ruling. The clarification I provided was that, in my view, it was improper to object to a motion that had not even been tabled in the first place. To that extent, he could only object to a motion after it had been tabled and before it had been seconded by another member. Honorable members, it is my considered view that when the notice of emotion requirements under Order 78 and 79 have been complied with, same must be present on the face of the order paper after the speaker has made a determination of the admissibility of the motion. For the avoidance of doubt, a member intending to file a motion, which is not of an agent nature, and is not subject to the exceptions under Order 78, the member must comply with the requirements of Order 79. Out of the abundance of caution, I read Order 79. It says, 79.1, all notices shall be given by being handed in at the table when the house is sitting or by being transmitted to the office of the clerk so as to be receivable within the hours prescribed for the purpose. Two, all notices shall be signed by the member proposing the motion or amendment, unquote. When a notice is received by the clerk later than 48 hours before the commencement, or the end of a meeting, the clerk shall record the date and hour of his receipt and notify the member. Four, every notice shall be submitted to Mr. Speaker, who shall direct that it be printed in its original terms or with such amendments as he shall direct, or that it be returned to the member submitting it as being inadmissible, unquote. These are the standing orders. The effect of this provision is that Mr. Speaker is the determinant of the admissibility of motion, just as is the case with the admissibility of questions to ministers under our orders. Having admitted the motion, the motion may now be transmitted to the order paper to form part of the deliberation of the House for the scheduled date. And this is done through the business committee chaired by the majority leader and leader of government business. The members, the decision of the speaker may be challenged with respect to the admissibility of a motion. Therein lies the bane of contention that undergoes this House in yesterday's proceedings. To provide some guidance on the appropriate procedure and why I ruled that the Deputy Majority Leader raises his objection after tabling of the motion and before seconding, I make reference to our standing orders. Order 81 is to the effect that no motion shall be debated and entered into the proceedings unless the motion has been seconded. In this vein, a motion tabled and not seconded will be struck out and it will not enter the votes and proceedings of the House. Again, Order 82 highlights the fact that once a motion is tabled and seconded, a member may only withdraw the motion with the leave of the House. The careful greening of the provisions as referred to supra 
will provide a clear perspective on the effect of seconding motions. Once a motion is tabled and seconded, it ought to be debated by the House, and the motion may not be withdrawn except with the leave of the House. Similarly, if an objection is to be leveled against a motion so admitted by Mr. Speaker, it will be procedurally deficient to allow such an objection to be raised after the motion has been seconded. The purpose of the objection to the motion is to prevent the House from discussing or considering the motion. The objection goes to the root of the matter being tabled, either because it is considered irrelevant, contentious, or unprofitable, or that for any reason is thought to be advisable to debate, is not thought to be advisable to debate the matter. And so, when such an objection is raised, and sustained, the motion is not captured by the rules and proceedings. When it is seconded, it must proceed to be debated, and it will be captured by the rules and proceedings. That is what the standing orders say. And that is why, after the motion has been seconded, the House has a duty to debate the motion and have it entered in the vote and position of the House, or have it withdrawn with the leave of the House, as the case may be. With this understanding, I ruled that it would not be correct to consider an objection to the motion at the point the motion is being moved or tabled. Because before the motion has been tabled, nothing is before the House. It would therefore also be inappropriate to consider an objection to a motion at that point. That was the spirit of my ruling, wherein I asked the Deputy Majority Leader to suspend his objection and raise it after the motion has been tabled. I was very clear on this. When I was handing over to the first deputy speaker, that was the message you saw me transmitting to him. That I have ruled that the deputy majority leader can raise his objection to the motion after it's moved, but not seconded. Because some of you were talking to each other. You did not hear the ruling. And yesterday, different thing was being said. In spite of the fact that the deputy majority leader insisted that this was my ruling. It came, therefore, to me as a surprise. When I learned that the members of the minority appeared to suggest to the deputy speaker who was in the chair at the time, that I indicated in my ruling that the objection be raised after it has been seconded. The records are there, the voice can be played. That was not my ruling. Honorable members, we must observe the rulings of Mr. Speaker and not attempt to vary them to our advantage as and when it appears convenient. In some on this issue, and for the purposes of future deliberations, objections to motions may be raised when a motion has been tabled and before it has been seconded. At that point, the speaker shall make a determination as to whether or not to uphold the motion and make a ruling day two. This is my ruling. Another issue that requires addressing 
is the decision of the first deputy speaker to upend my admission of the motion and rule that the motion should not have been admitted in the first place. Honorable members, it is interesting to note that this is the second time the first deputy speaker has taken the chair and has made a ruling which, in fact, was to overrule a position I had earlier on established before the House. In fact, the second deputy speaker was, the first deputy speaker was in my office. And what I'm telling you today, I told him before he left to the airport. The first deputy speaker has contended, and rightfully so, on several occasions, that he is not the speaker. I have also, on several occasions, alluded to various areas of parliamentary practice, where when the speaker is in the chair, makes a ruling, another presiding officer may not overturn that ruling. My former statement on the matters arising from the budget and captured in paragraph 46 read as follows, and I quote, Honorable members, although outstanding orders are silent on this, many standard orders and rules from several sister parliaments provide persuasive rules who suggest that when deputy speakers or acting speakers are in the chair, whatever happens in the House is that officer's responsibility. And the speaker cannot be called upon to overrule it. Similarly, the reverse is also the case that when a speaker is in the chair, whatever happens in the house is the speaker's responsibility. And the deputy speaker or acting speaker cannot be called upon to overrule it on court. That was what I read to the house that day. The penchant of the first deputy speaker to overrule my rulings is to say the least unconstitutional illegal and offensive. Be that as it may, I shall not be taking any steps to overrule the decision of the first deputy speaker to dismiss the motion as moved by the honorable ranking member of the finance committee. The deputy speakers and I we deliberate on how to present a more coherent and uniform structure in respect of rulings so that the House is guided at all times during deliberations. Our standing orders provide the procedure for challenging the rulings of the Chair, and those agree by the rulings may take the necessary steps. The proposals of the private member's motion may thus be guided by the standing orders of the House to right the wrong. I hope this is understood. And I repeat, I hope this statement provides a much needed clarity on the matters of dispute that arose yesterday. And I hope we can forge ahead for the common good of the people who have entrusted us with leadership and a mandate to better their lives. The standing orders will guide those who brought the motion and the proper thing will be done for the house to consider the motion. That is what he did yesterday. If you want for emphasis five, so that the record will have it, Mr. Speaker. I'm saying so because 
as you yourself have rightly advised, we will challenge the ruling of your first deputy to which you have so eloquently addressed this morning. But I want the record to be suddenly captured that this was his objection. His objection was based on Article 187. He, he said so, so that tomorrow into the foreseeable future, we will know what guided the ruling for purpose of uh, litigating on it as we intend to do. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. You're welcome back from the break. This is Duke's view. Uh, Candidly, I just have just some 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 um, few few comments about what is happening within the speakership of parliament, about what is happening between the friction between the speaker and his first deputy, um, as as has played out this week. I don't want to know the reasons. We really don't care about the reasons. And as the speaker has rightly posited or made it known, many Ghanaians are not happy with the conduct of parliament. Many Ghanaians are not happy with what has happened in Parliament over the period. Many Ghanaians are complaining about whether indeed Parliament is for itself or it is working in the interest of uh, the teeming number of Ghanaians. Whatever the problem is, whatever the problem is, whatever the underlying factor is, whatever the underpinning factors are, the speakership, first, second, and the main speaker, should resolve this issue. They should resolve this matter. This seeming friction, this decision subsequent to overturning whatever it is, these are very experienced politicians. First and second, uh, the speaker and the first deputy speaker are very experienced politicians. They, 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 they've not been in this game today. Understand the politics. They understand its implication on national, uh, on, on national cohesion and the national interest and the signals that this is sending to, 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 to the international community. Ghana, as the poster boy of democracy, of the Africa rising narrative, much more needs to be done. And it, 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 it is bad, it is wrong, it is not pleasing to the eye. It is not very comforting to know that there is some form of friction between the first and second, the, the first, the speaker and the first deputy speaker. With all the trading of words and whatever that, that has transpired over the period. We shouldn't have, that, this motion shouldn't have been admitted in the first place. It's unconstitutional, illegal and offensive and all of that. Uh, it doesn't really augur well for, for, for the picture, for the image of parliament and for the cohesion this kind of parliament. We've seen what has transpired over the period in this parliament. Because we say that if the fish will rot, it rots from its head. So if parliament is going to be one cohesive body interested in pushing the national interest, then of course the unity must start right from the, from the leadership. And so the speaker and the first deputy speaker, I don't think it's gotten to the point where yet where we need external factors, peace council, Pentecostal council, and council of state to come in and the rest. I think this issue can be resolved within themselves. It's good they are still talking to each other because the speaker told us that he told the first deputy speaker right in his face before he traveled. So it means that there's still some communication going on, but whatever the issue is, it needs to be thrashed out. I think um, we need peace on that front in the leadership of parliament, especially at the top speakership. And that's how we wrap up this week, uh, Duke's view this week and by extension the chamber. Uh, my name is Duke Mentopoko. Keep watching CTV for the very best in programming.